an FGG fluorodeoxyglucose scan. And I'll tell you, the, uh, the clue is that the brain is hot. Again, the brain, of course, uses glucose. So an FDG scan is one which basically looks at glucose uptake. So, it, so and you can see all these metastases. So in a patient who's got a number of metastases, if the metastases uh, are very metabolically active, then you will see this kind of uptake. But the clue that it's an FDG scan is the brain is hot, okay? Uh, because there's lots of different labels as you can see in this, this question, and we'll do that at the end of the session. Okay, so let's, uh, let's make a quick start. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the cases uh, that were partly discussed in the Pichichi meeting and Fausto's um, endocrine symposium to really go through in particular a question that a lot of people had about pituitary sampling and how to interpret it. Okay, so um, let's start off about talking about how to wean patients off uh, steroids. Uh, it's something I spoke about at the BES, but I want to just go a bit more slowly to make sure that everyone's on board with how we do this, okay? Now, if you've got any questions, do use the chat, or if you feel very brave, you can unmute or put your hand up, and I'm trying to watch both screens, okay? But here is a key point. So if you have one adrenal removed, you should be completely normal and not need steroids, okay? That's a really key uh, message that I want to get across. So supposing you are a patient who has adrenal cushing. So there's my adrenal tumor, and the tumor is making a large excess of cortisol. Okay, so that patient therefore is going to have clinical Cushing's syndrome. Okay, adrenal driven, very high cortisol, which will suppress the corticotrophs, and therefore the patient will not have any. ACTH, okay? And that is the key point, really, because if there's no ACTH, then the other adrenal gland will atrophy. And this might be going on for months, okay? Or years, in fact, as the patient gets slowly more Cushingoid. But the minute the cortisol is a little bit higher than it should be, you'll suppress the axis. And that's before the patient presents. And then the patient gets more and more Cushingoid and the adrenal gland on the other side is completely flattened, okay? Maybe, maybe years. Okay, so then one day you see the patient, diagnose them, find the tumor, and you remove it. And the next day, the patient, of course, will have no cortisol, okay? Less than 50 if you measure it, because, of course, these corticotropes are suppressed, and therefore, the patient is going to need exogenous uh, steroid replacement. And traditionally, we have all used hydrocortisone, which is fine, 10, 5, and 2.5. Or you can use about prednisolone 3 milligrams once daily. And they're pretty equivalent, okay? And I'm not going to say one better than the other, but there is lots of other factors that one can think about. But whichever one you use, if you give a bit too much, the suppression will persist. And therefore, the ACTH will continue to be zero. And so what you have to do is minimize the dose. And that is difficult in the patient with Cushing's because as you reduce the dose, the patient gets all kinds of aches and pains and difficulties, okay? But that's what you have to do if you want to have any hope. And it takes a long time for these corticotrophs to recover because they've been suppressed for maybe three or four years. So you can't suddenly stop the steroid, otherwise you will have a crisis. So you've got to do it very slowly. But if you underrun them slightly, then the ACTH will start to rise very slowly. You'll get a bit of recovery. The adrenal gland is still suppressed, so that needs to be a bit high. And when that happens, after a long period, you might get adrenal recovery. And if you do that, then the patient will slowly have a rise in cortisol. And when it reaches 200, you can probably get them off the bread completely. In fact, you might need to underrun them before they reach 200, as I'm going to show you, to have any hope of success. Okay, so that's the background. So to summarize, if you are used to a very high cortisol, then weaning is difficult because you have to deliberately underrun in order to stimulate the adrenals to recover. And it's very tempting to continue replacement because as you cut the dose, 
the patient complains of tiredness. Tiredness is a very difficult uh, symptom to talk about, but they feel tired. And so it's easier to leave them on it. And so the question I've asked myself in the past, and I think I've got this wrong in the past, is it harmful to stay on lifetime replacement compared to having a normal axis? See, because once you're on replacement, you can't suddenly stop it. So you either go for a gradual wean and work really hard at the start um, and go through the aches and pains and reassure them and monitor them, or you might choose to leave them on a replacement dose. And I used to do the latter, but I think we should stop doing the latter and move to try to have a normal axis. So we've started using this protocol, okay? And even this for some of these patients is a bit fast, but essentially getting from five to three should not be too difficult. Now, one of the problems with Cushing's patients is they are used to much higher levels than this, okay? And all of you think that five of bread is a normal replacement dose, okay? A lot of people, in fact, the older textbooks say 7.5. So when I was a trainee, we used to give patients five in the morning and 2.5 in the late afternoon, okay? Which is a large excess I now realize. But 7.5 was a kind of said to be a normal replacement dose. But what we're finding more and more, we have patients who've got no adrenal glands, so being removed for on three milligrams once daily and pretty stable. So if three is a normal replacement dose, and for some patients it might be a bit more or a bit less, but if three is a normal replacement dose, then if you give three milligrams, you will persistently suppress the pituitary and the other adrenal. And so you therefore have to wean them below that. Now, this is more difficult because this is when the patient will really feel it because their own adrenal has got to wake up. And if you give them a two milligram dose once, they will underrun that day. But before they feel really uncomfortable and achy, they're back to three, okay? So that's, that's sort of what I'm trying to do. And then the following week, you give them two little kicks of the adrenal gland. And the following week, you give them three. And if you do this, you will end up on two milligrams after seven weeks. And then you might keep going. Look, some patients are a bit scared. And so I've said to them, well, if you want to stay at week 11, I'll show you. So you feel ready to come back because they need to want to do this. Okay, it's the other thing. They need to be on board with the plan and they need a clear explanation as to why we're doing it. So I'm gonna illustrate this with a very interesting uh, case that you've all voted on, I'm gonna vote again. So this patient presented in March, 2021, uh, so a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, with a cortisol of 529 and a fully suppressed ACTH. And she had a low dose dexpression test. And you can see this is at the start and at the end of the test, the 40 hour cortisol was 500. OK, and the urinary cortisols are all up. So this is not like a difficult case. This is an obviously Cushingoid patient. Right. So we're not talking about is it Cushing's or not. Definitely Cushing. Now, because the adrenal, the ACTH is suppressed, we think it's adrenal, and so we do a CT scan. So here is her CT, and there is the, so I'll just move the picture out of the way from my other screen. Yeah, so there is the uh, liver, there's a spleen at the back here, and we're gonna see a few more of the images that we're watching in this one, okay? And there's the stomach, with all its food in it, a bit of gas, in the back. So we're looking for, I'm going to scroll through this now, okay, and we're looking for the adrenal gland, and you can see the beginning on this side of the right adrenal, and there is a lump touching the left adrenal. So it's quite big, okay, and it's a nice removable lesion, okay, and it's touching, and this is the kidney behind it, and there's the little one limb of the adrenal gland, go up one, okay, and so there's obviously, and on the other side, a nice normal adrenal gland. So you can see a clear adrenal tumour. Okay, so the patient then um, has an, adre a, an adrenalectomy. Okay, um, in fact, before then, she's put on medical treatment until we get a date, but on the 10th of August, so six months after that result, she has a left adrenalectomy, and um, her post-op cortisol was 31 nanomoles per litre on the 10th of August. So that is clearly insufficient for normal life and so she discharged on replacement and the surgeons gave her pred five for four days then four for four days and then three and they said stay on this till the endocrine team see you 
which is pretty reasonable. And I don't know how she felt, but this is quite a quick drop. But she's on normal replacement. And then, of course, COVID was around and she needed a lot of follow up. And so she wasn't. She stayed on Pred 3 for a whole year. And um, she then came to clinic because she got booked in 12 months later because that's us kind of backup system is dreadful. Okay. Anyway, she reported having learned the sick day rules from our endocrine nurse, luckily, before she went. So when she felt really ill with COVID in December 21, she doubled her dose to six milligrams of bread, got through it and back down to three. She also reported that she forgot a prednisolone one morning and would never do that again because she became really unwell, became very sick, started vomiting and became dehydrated, probably because she was vomiting. Um, and she basically the next day just took a pred three. She didn't take the, an extra dose, which I think she should have, but she suddenly thought, I wonder if that's the cause. And she took her pred three the next day and she felt better. And then she stayed on three. And she didn't see any doctors at all in this time. Okay, So a bit scary, that missing of pred three. So then she comes to the clinic and she has this Sanaxan test, 59.76.81. And the baseline ACTH is 78, okay, which is normal 10 to 30. So a nice, generous ACTH. So let me launch this poll again and see. Now it's going to give you six options, okay? And let me just uh, relaunch. Clear. Okay. So I know that there's six options. Just move that and I, that uh, box out of the way and just use options A, B, C, or D. So there's her synaptin test. Remember, she's had a year on three milligrams of bread, and I'd like you to all vote for what you think is the best option. And the options are switch to hydrocortisone, 10.55, reduce the bread to two and a half, stay on the same dose of three, or increase the bread. And I'm just waiting for, I would like all of you, I can see there are 104 people to vote. You all need to vote, okay? You really must. I'm gonna give you all 10 more seconds. And then I'll tell you what I did. Oh, I'm sorry, Hardia. Okay. You can't click on the poll. It might be that you're on the web version. Um, anyway, thank you for letting me know. So maybe there are a few technical issues. But in that case, I will now end the poll and show the results. Okay, so as you can see, most of you are now thinking, because I've obviously biased you correctly, I told you that I really want to get patients off, but that's a really low synaptic test, isn't it? So it's a bit scary, which is why some of you said, let's stay on hydrocortisone, which will probably be forever. And then some of you have chosen C or D. But in fact, I chose B, which is slightly worrying. I will be honest, I did feel a bit nervous, but I did discuss with the patient in detail. So you had a whole year on three, and your synaptic test is the only thing that encouraged me was this ATTH of 78. I thought we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make it, I thought. And so we went on the long uh, road uh, downhill to get the dose down. Just to, to point out, by the way, that um, those of you I've just downloaded from SurveyMonkey before I told you the, the reason I want to get them off steroids. And that, and then most of you voted to either stay on hydrocortisone, which I think would be forever or stay on bread three, I think forever. And not many of you chose to reduce the dose, but I'm glad that we've now switched that because I think it's a really important learning point and I will show you why. So this is a question like the same question, the same synaptic test, okay? I made these, it's not quite so high as this one, okay? Because in real life it was 78. So maybe I'm being a bit unfair, but here are the key things. Like she has a normal pituitary gland. She had no pituitary surgery. She has a normal right adrenal gland that's been suppressed. And the problem is, I think that even adequate replacement will prevent uh, re uh, recovery. You need to underrun. So I've got two pages on prednisolone on our web page that I will show you the key things of. So pred replacement. So here are some 
prednisolone levels. Now I know this is research and it's something, it's not something that everyone does, but it is available if people want it. I don't think you need it though, okay? I'm using it to justify what we're doing, but you don't need to do levels. But what we have found is that some patients are on prednisolone two milligrams and we do levels and these are the, the reference ranges that we generated after doing about 500 such data curves. And one of the things we have found, and this is really what we've done, and that's to say the replacement level at the end of eight hours should be between 15 and 25. Okay, it's a number to remember. So I was a bit nervous, as I said, and I saw that synactin test. So before I said, we'll cut you to two, I said, let's just see if you are enough. So I did a pred day curve, and here we are. So this is our reference range. So she, her level is 17. And Sophie's asking, well, I don't think it does. I don't think it tells us anything, but it's in, it tells me that there is hope. Okay, that's but the only thing that, uh, that that helped me with. The other thing though is that the eight hour pred level was seventeen, and she felt well. Okay, so three of pred is sufficient for her, and it's not excessive, but it's suppressive. And and one of the problems is if you take prednisolone every morning or hydrocortisone three times a day, you're going to have your thirst dose when you wake up, and that's not the same as the circadian rhythm that we believe is important, okay? Now, the circadian rhythm, I'll show you in a minute, will remind you, it rises before you wake up, and that's something that we've failed to reproduce. There's some drugs that are coming out, that have come out, that try to do this. We take the night before, but um, we need to just get a bit more data on them before we use them. But the key thing is if you can wake up your own adrenal, that's going to be a winner in terms of circadian rhythms. So here's my key point. The level at eight hours is a good replacement dose. And I want to underrun. OK, and if we underrun, then we might be able to um, increase the level of agitation cortisol. So B, as all you put this time, is my best option. So I've also got a page on prednisone withdrawal. And um, so this is a bit about what I told her to do. So, so we started this. She's on three every day, been on this for a year. I said, look, next Thursday, take two. And then the following week, keep going down and see how you feel. Um, and so she did. And by October the 11th, okay, so that's another two months on, she has this synaptin test. So it was 50, 70, 80. It's now 125. 137, 135. So there's a bit of a rise, okay? But it's not really rising at all. It's better. Now, my best hypothesis, I don't know this, my best hypothesis is that her adrenal is maxed out because it was suppressed for so long. And given this pretty potent drug of 76, giving more ACTH is unable at the moment to cause any further stimulation because that's as much as it can make because it's atrophied, okay? So it's got to not just wake up, it's not quite the right way, it's got to grow, okay? It's a trophic hormone, it's got to grow. I just saw something in the chat here from Alison. 78 is high to simulate some recovery. Yes, okay, so uh, so I will say that I've also cheated, I haven't put in all this data. I did a lot of ACH levels through the day and shortly after you get the PRED, it really drops. So So I wonder, I wonder whether the PRED, the steel replacement, is suppressing the axis for the rest of the day. Well, I know it is because when you give her PRED, the ACTH then falls. I mean, there's no validity to what I'm saying. I'm just telling you that I did it and we found that. So what I want to do now is keep going. Okay, and the point really is that the level of PRED suppresses the ACTH, I think, even three milligrams, okay? And of course, if you take thrice daily hydrocortisone, then you're going to be these late peaks, which will persistently suppress. It's a bit like reverse circadian. What we really want is a circadian rhythm. So if you've got no adrenals or no pituitary and you need replacement, then PRED3 is fine. But if you've got any chance of recovery, I think we should really go for it. I will say it's not easy. So we got to the 11th of October and she's now on two milligrams. And now you see her levels are actually underrunning. So her levels are, it was 17, it's now 10, which is below our therapeutic range and she was nervous to keep going so I said okay we'll keep going on two milligrams and we'll see how you go so she stayed on two milligrams for a month this is from the 11th of October 
And she stayed on that same week 11. She didn't go forward. She stayed on week 11 for four weeks. So it's, so that's what she wanted to do. She was nervous to cut. And then on November 28th, she emailed me saying, I think, I think I'm ready to try. So on the 1st of December, she had one mammogram. And on the 2nd of December, she came and had a synactin test. And on that occasion, she's got a baseline ACTH of 130 and a synactin that goes 187, 189, 218. And just for enthusiasm, we had another cortisol. So there is a bit of uh, encouragement here. She hadn't quite reached my made up cut of 200, but I'm, in, I'm positive now that I should keep going. And um, this, is, this is last month, really. So this is where we are now. And so on Jan the 2nd, she was on one milligram every day. And she's now, this is today. Uh, week 19 and she's still on one milligram but this Thursday she's going to try a zero okay and here's the email um she's on pred one milligram and she goes happy new year I'm fine to continue without any testing I said do you want a selection test because actually you don't need any tests okay if you feel okay that's the that's what we're going to go on. if you don't feel well I'm not going to push you to cut the dose and then she says here I seem to sleep better on one milligram I wonder I wonder I don't know this but I wonder if that's because when she's on less, she starts to get her early morning rises. Okay, now this is completely me making it up, but I do, I do like the idea of a normal. I mean, this is our trading. You see these pulses. This is a healthy volunteer on the left, okay, who had a load of uh, levels of cortisol, and they've done this deconvolution. Let's work out how much you make in pulses, and and it's very clear that we know that there's our and our trading pulse leads you to it, which you don't get with either prednisolone or hydrocortisone. And the problem is we don't understand what controls it. Why you get those frequency, why you get that number of pulses is really not clear. But what I'd like to do is let her do her own thing and so get her off it. So that's where we're going, okay? And as I've said before, pred is, is pretty good, but it's not as good as starting early and same with hydrocortisone. And this, this third peak is the one that really worries me. So my key learning point here is that we should really work hard to wean patients who've got Cushing's off their steroids. Okay, and this has been, I've learned this in, uh, well, over the last year and a half, I've been trying out a few patients. And it's very hard because reducing steroids does cause aches and pains, and the patients and doctors assume they are dependent on steroids. You say, I think that's like 50, you think I'm not going to try. But in that patient, because I knew she had another adrenal, I was really going to go for it, okay? We don't understand normal circadian or arteriotin rhythm, um, but any replacement uh, is therefore not as good as your own axis, I believe. Some people ask me, does it matter? And I think it does. I think as you get older, it's going to have more of an impact. She's very young. This lady's only 28 now. Now, I'm going to show you something um, that has worried me. Okay, this is, here's the question now. Can we follow the same protocol in patients the answer is yes, yes, I've been using. So that, that protocol I learned from the vasculitis forum, which are a whole bunch of patients who have SLE and they and they really want to come off their steroids whenever their disease goes into remission. And they they really struggle to go below three. And they didn't know why, but I explained to them that when you get to three, then your origin's got to wake up. So what they do, they, they're on like 30, okay, and then they cut to 20, 15, 10, 5, and then they go 4, 3, and they all said it's really hard to go below 3. Um, and so they came up with that protocol. I met them a few times. We tried different things, but that's that's one that I think we should be using, okay, and not switch to hydrocortisone, which um, which the problem with hydrocortisone, it's not like it's a bad drug. It's, 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 it tells you that the patient needs replacement, and therefore no one tries to wean them, okay? So here is the patient that's worried me, okay? Um, she's 59 when we first met her, and she had a previous history of chronic fatigue. So already you can tell it's going to be hard to wean her off if she's on steroids. And then she clinically became Cushingoid, okay? Really, it was real Cushing, not just the tiredness. And when she finally got uh, investigated, after quite a long time, everyone ignored her because she was tired all the time. Her midnight cortisol was 435. Her baseline AC is suppressed at less than five. And then she's a load of depression test. And this is June 2012. Okay, so this is like 10, 11 years ago. Her baseline cortisol is 622. 
and the two-hour value is 460. So let's just let me just launch this poll again. I just need to go relaunch and continue. So you should on your screens have a B. So you just move that to the right hand side so you can see the three options. There's only three options, and that is A, B, or C. So if you could all vote now. I'll give you all 10 seconds because the vote's coming in nice and quickly this time. So please do vote, okay? Please do vote. Okay, 10 seconds. Yes, and one of you wrote that in the chat. The public chat is to tell everyone else what you think, so it's not anonymous. But yes, this is adrenal question. It must be adrenal because the ACTH is suppressed. Okay, so you see this basic is undetectable. So we know there's going to be an adrenal lesion. Uh, some people put B. Um, it can't be because ectopic A will have a very high CH. Maybe you can notice. And the same with A. You have a high or at least detectable ACTH. So this is an adrenal, adrenal lesion. So, of course, what you need to do then is image. I'll go straight to the image and the report. And there is, just like the other patient, this is her image in 2012, okay, 20 December 2012, clinical Cushing Lloyd, investigations in keeping with adrenal source. And the diagnosis is a 5.5 centimeter adrenal tumor. And as I said, she's clinically and biochemically Cushing Lloyd. So she needs that removed 10 years ago, okay? So, about a year later, it seems to have taken to get to surgery, but at the age of 60, she has a left adrenalectomy and she's sent home on 10-5-5-5 cortisone, which is our standard protocol. And that's in March 2013, okay? And she's on 10-5-5, nice replacement dose. She's got chronic fatigue, remember, she's tired all the time. So she comes up in December and has a synaptin test and the ATH is a bit low and there's clearly a flat synaptin test. Okay, zero, 60, 80. And those days we used to do long snap until we saw that and thought no hope. But then I thought a year later, let's do a long synaptin test. And the long synaptin test used to be a milk hour deposynaptin and you did cortisol. And the first three are the short equivalent. You think it's worse, right? It's now 100, 160, 190. So pretty similar, maybe a bit better than it was. A year ago, and then it goes 200, 200, 200, and then the next morning, 653. Now, the cutoff in our Bible in those days was 900, which would be normal, so she's not quite normal, but there clearly is some hope. Okay, so the peak long snap was 653. Now, of course, we had one more year of long snap, and then and then depot snap disappeared from the pharmacopoeia, so we don't have it anymore. But the patient, because of this and this, and not quite reaching enough. And because of chronic fatigue, stayed on 1055. Okay. And so I said, yes, stay on 1055. And then a year later, I tried again. I thought, let's see how, and it's worse now. Okay. The, the next day. So the problem with 1055, it's persistently suppressing the full recovery of the adrenal gland. And she's not one. She's not on my side. That's the problem I had. She was not saying, I really want to come off this. She's saying, I can't. I feel knackered. But she was knackered before, so so that's I should have I should have pushed it, but we didn't. One more snack test, 50, 170, 218. So there is hope, isn't there? But I wasn't in the mode, and the patient definitely wasn't. And so that's the summary of what we got so far. We made a pragmatic plan to stop trying to give up steroids and say, look, we'll give up trying to wean you. You're on steroids, and so I think you know come off. And when she last came to click in November. She was on 10 and 5. Um, it was 10, 5, 5. So sometime between over lockdown, she's ended up on 10 and 5. She's now 70. Now, what's happened since then? So on December the 16th, see, this is a problem. She is dependent on her hydrocortisone. So if she gets confused, so what happened? She got flu. She came in really unwell. I think all of you had a really busy time over Christmas. But um, she, she basically stopped her hydrocortisone and went into acute renal failure, currently 500 proper Addisonian features. Because the adrenal is completely atrophied, it looks like she needs some aldosterone as well. Anyway, the problem is she's older. She's really got used to being on all this um, 
all this steroid and so uh, she comes in and ends up on intensive care she's just come off intensive care now so she's back on the general ward but I really think to myself if I had really worked hard at the start of this and got her off the steroid 10 years ago eight years ago she's now 70 I'm not going to succeed now or maybe I'll try if she survives um so they put I've noticed they put her on prednisolone now and she's on double dose she should be on three uh, but she's really not well, so I don't know whether we're going to succeed. So this is my this is my worry. She's got an adrenal. This is not pituitary cushion. This is adrenal cushion. I should have really worked hard at it, and I'm I'm unhappy with myself for not having done it properly. Um, but there you go. So there's the message. Let's see. Okay. So for you, long synaptin is no longer available. Okay. So that's history. Um, and I, to be honest, I don't think I should have done it. I think the short synaptin test uh, was gave me the information we need. And so depo synaptin tests are going to go the same way as high dose depression test, i.e. not used. The only thing that's worth saying is, um, yes, well done. It, well done. She was on opiates too. And, um, and that's absolutely right, uh, Dr. Bishop. I think that was flashed up there for a second. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so your comment is very bad if all you can see. So, so um, pa pain is a is a pain aches and pains and things make it more difficult. I'm just going to chat to you if there's any other questions or points about that before we move on. We've got some cases to get through, so I mustn't waffle on. Okay, and then somebody asked about whether we can use this in patients who have got steroid dependence. And the answer is yes. So the commonest cause of real Cushing syndrome is exogenous glucorticoids for SLE, asthma, anything, okay? There's an added problem, and that is not just that the adrenals got to recover, the primary condition, the chest problem, the SLE might reactivate, and that is not an endocrine problem. And so there's a very difficult area on weaning. And here is my rule, okay? We should not get involved in weaning steroids which are prescribed by a rheumatologist or a chest physician or anybody else until they are sure the patient's condition is in remission and they're on three milligrams of bread. When it gets down to three, then I think we can be helpful. But if they're still on five, that means they're on a dose that is actually helping their condition possibly. Okay. And if we try to wean it and their asthma comes back or their SLE comes back, it's, we don't know what to do. So we need them to tell us. So when someone says, can you see this patient who's on 20 of bread? The answer is no, I can't help you. Okay. And they do that sometimes. Sometimes the specialist referral team say, we need endocrine help to get this patient off steroids. We can't help them if their condition is active. Okay. You will have a C. There are some new monoclonal antibodies for some diseases in many specialities that are enabling patients who were still dependent to wean. This is now happening in asthma. There's a bunch of new maps and they're saying, ah, oh, good news, you don't need your prednisolone anymore. They've been on it for 20 years and uh, we need to help them. And uh, if they've got an adrenal and a pituitary and have never had surgery, then they should be able to come off it. And it's really hard because there's a separate problem, the aches and pains they get as they cut the dose. So to summarize this, if the primary disease does remit, then steroids can be weaned, and we still need to allow time for the HPA axis to recover and for any adrenal atrophy that will have happened to reverse. And, and what I will suggest is switching to hydrocortisone. We, I used to do this as so hydrocortisone because I say, well, you need replacement, but they don't. They just need to wean until their adrenals recover. Um, hydrocortisone's problem is firstly that late peak and secondly people assume that it means that they're on replacement so to sophie i would say yes use the same chart um, together with symptoms so so you, you actually don't need uh synaptin tests because if you look as i've found you find that chest people uh, dermatologists, they've got protocols to go 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 at different slow rates, okay? There's a very interesting protocol I found especially with temporal arthritis that really, that is of a long scale, a very slow reduction in PRED. 
below three, does it play any physiological role? Oh, it's not placebo. It's not placebo. Um, because if you're on PrEP3, that is that will suppress your adrenal. And when you go down to two, you need some adrenal recovery. Otherwise, you will be a bit adisonian. So that's why I think these little pulses of lower doses, it's not, but this is real, okay? If you suddenly stop it like that first patient I told you about, you start vomiting, you really have a crisis. So steroids make people dependent on it. Given the height of half-life, are the patients not without any cortisol in the early hours of the morning? It possibly, possibly. Um, the only thing is that, um, I mean, it's possible, yeah? So, so what we really need, um, if we want to really prove the point, is a randomized controlled trial. And that, uh, this is my bias I'm showing you now, is that don't switch to hydrocortisone, um, which I find more difficult to wean. But, um, but yes, we should uh, do randomized trials to prove which one, if one is better than the other. What you'll find, right, is that people, and I'm the same, will say, well, I do work, so I'm going to say this is the best way to do it. And some people have got people off hydrocortisone, you know, you have a protocol where you miss out the last dose for a bit, and miss out the middle dose for a bit, and cut them 2.5. They're all, they're all fine, as long as your target is to get them off the steroid. Okay. Right, and now I'm going to ask um, Shama and these. First of all, Shama, I'm going to stop sharing. So Shama, are you here? If you would like to share your screen, I will... Wait for you to. Hi, good morning. Hi. So, so Shan, what you need to do is if you, if you just share your screen, it'll overwrite sure. mine. Okay. Is it clear now? Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes, you want to. Yes, we can. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Shama Shamsi. I'm an endocrine SPR and Charing Cross Hospital. Today, I'm going to present a case that will show what I named a flat IPSS. We will start with the background history of this patient. At the time of the diagnosis, she was diagnosed in 2013. She was 62 years old at that time. So I summarized the case because we wanted to highlight is what, what we wanted to highlight in this case is the IPSS result. And afterward, as Prof. Mirren has been discussing earlier, the afterward care of, uh, after the uh, treatment. So this patient, she presented in a different facility with the new diagnosis of diabetes hypertension earlier in March 2013. What was interesting about this patient is that in three, in three weeks' time, she, she went into remission with normal cortisol level, actually. But she was actually... Uh, um, complaining about weakness, uh, bone pain, she had uh, easy, bruise, bruise, uh, easy bruising, and she also uh, was having respiratory symptoms. So her case has been discussed in a different uh, MDT, including neuroendocrine tumor, adrenal MDT, and in the uh, respiratory uh, uh, lung cancer MDT as well. She had a CT scan done in June 2013 that showed 1.6 centimeter right lung nodule. And also because when she was, she had normal uh, levels, she had an IPSS, which we will discuss later. And she had a pituitary MRI that was reported as, as normal. She continued to be investigated under pulmonary team. And she had, uh, and there was a discussion about having a biopsy done. However, because of the location of the lesion, it was difficult to biopsy. So there was a suggestion in one of the MDTs to have a gallium dotate PET scan done that reported a right lower lobe lesion with increased dotate uptake. At that point in August also, what happened to this patient? She had uh, symptoms of hypoglycemia, hypo hypotension, and her peak cortisol went down to 309, and she required steroid replacement. Uh, replacement. So this is the her gallium dotate, and you can see the radiologist, thankfully, high highlighted the lesion, which was uh, on the right side, on top of just on top of the diaphragm here. What happened after that is the patient again got an active cushion, uh, so she she again uh, had had more like symptoms, and she she had a chest uh, sorry a bone scan that showed an osteopenia with a collapsed fracture, 
and her symptoms continued to, uh, to surge. So she had a repeat baseline testing that showed an ACTH level of 431, cortisol level of 2026, and her potassium level was 3.2. She had more dynamic and extensive testing, and she was confirmed to have cyclic and ACTH dependent, dependent Cushing's. Now, if you can use again the, uh, the uh, poll for answering this question, how would you uh, test to distinguish if that is pituitary or ectopic source of ACTH secretion? Would ACTH level be enough, the potassium level, high dose dexamethasone suppression test, imaging, or IPSS? Okay, so you can all vote now. I think you are. Okay, I'll give you five seconds. And then I'm gonna, here we go, okay. Okay, so we got 71% IPSS, which is the correct answer. Okay, can I just hold on there? I can see quite a lot yes. of people that see high dose text suppression tests. Um, we need to talk about this because um, we used to do that, okay, to distinguish pituitary from other sources. Uh, but that test has been discredited because, and I'll, let me just briefly explain it. If you have Cushing syndrome, there is a 90% chance of it being pituitary. That's because pituitary is nine times as common, okay? So 10% of patients are ectopic and 90% are pituitary. So you can just guess and you write 90% with no tests. The hydrate suppression test is only 80% sensitive, correct? And therefore it's worse than guessing. And there's plenty of data published now saying the hydrate should be abandoned. And um, so those of you who put C need to review that. We're not doing that today, but I could do that again at some other point. Or in fact, there's a recording of something that I've made in the past. So hydrotex is, is um, should also be historical, like the long synactin test. Okay, it needs to be historical. Sorry, Sham, I want to uh, carry on then. I'll stop. Hey, I just wanted also. I just wanted to highlight this answer and what what has been um, highlighted also in the literature that. So the, those uh, both uh, both uh, tables are brought from Oxford Handbook for Endocrinology. So in terms of the ACTH level, it is known that a patient with ectopic Cushing tends to have higher level of ACTH uh, level. However, that is not a valid tool. And also in terms of the serum uh, potassium. Uh, less than 3.2. So patient with ectopic uh, uh, disease, like 100% of those patients will have hypokalemia. Uh, and that is shown there, but also from pituitary, uh, the, like in pituitary diseases, also the patient might have uh, hypokalemia. Uh, now, Prof. Miran has discussed already about the low dose uh, dexamethasone suppression test, but in, like just in terms of number, 90% of patients with pituitary disease will show more than 50% suppression, and 10% of ectopic patients will have like will have suppression. How and and they also reported that if, if the diagnosis is uh, carcinoid, 50 more than 50% will suppress as well. And this gives the controversy like the, the controversiality about those testing. Yeah, I, I think you see, just go that's, that's right. So that nine, just go back to that slide. So yeah. 90 and 10 is the proportion of patients with opportunity and ectopic anyway. So the test doesn't help. It's just, you can just guess. Yeah. Okay. You got another question. I need to put the poll on, don't I? Yeah. Yes. So the next question is when, like, why do we use the IPSS actually, or when it is indicated? Is it to diagnose ectopic Cushing or to diagnose pituitary Cushing or to exclude pituitary Cushing or exclude ectopic Cushing? Okay, if you could all vote for that now. Okay, um, five seconds. This is much more controversial. I've just seen the, let me just end and share. 
Okay, so this is quite controversial, isn't it? Yes. yes. So um, let's go through this. So, so yeah, quite a spread. So, so the thing about IPSS is that it doesn't confirm anything. It simply excludes ectopic ACTH. So the people who put D are correct. Okay. Yeah. And if the patient definitely has got Cushing syndrome, then that leaves pituitary as the likely diagnosis. It doesn't exclude pituitary, but it doesn't diagnose pituitary Cushing's because if you do an IPSS in a healthy volunteer, then it'll, it'll show pituitary Cushing's. So that's why A and B are wrong. It's to exclude something that might be in the differential. So B and D, while they seem to say the same thing, don't. Okay, because B includes healthy volunteers. Okay, do you want to carry on? I'll just stop that. Yeah, okay. So IPSS actually should not be used to diagnose Cushing. It's, it's used only to exclude ectopic ACTH uh, sources, uh, only done after confirming hypercortisolysemia. So, and this is what happens if you do like this question has been raised actually. And this patient, she had an IPSS done to her when she had normal levels. So what would you, th what would you think will happen if you have it in a normal patient? I'll just go briefly about yeah. the, the process itself. How, do we, how, how, how is the IPSS is done? So uh, if you can see the, the uh, I cannot see it myself. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what happens? The intervention radiologist would you would go would go with one catheter in both side of uh, the inferior petrosal sinus, and you can see one coming from the right and one come from the left, and we'll have the third catheter insert, inserted pre preferably for blood collection. So the uh, the idea about the IPSS is to have a measurement of the central uh, central ACTH and peripheral ACTH at baseline and then after CRH stimulation. And this will need an excellent angiography. A uh, very rare complication would include brainstem vascular event and DVT. So after, uh, uh, after getting into the uh, inferior uh, uh, petrosa sin sinuses, which will be confirmed by the imaging and then by blood testing. So we collect the blood for ACTH, cortisol, and, uh, and prolactin. So the blood comes from both sides, from both catheter, and also from the peripheral. And it will be taken at baseline before five minutes of giving the uh, CRH and at zero time, and then after CRH at two, five, and 10. How do we interpret usually? We use the prolactin to uh, as a marker for successful catheterization, and the ratio will be central to peripheral ratio is around 1.8 or more of prolactin. And then we look at the level of ACTH and cortisol. Now, at baseline, if the level between uh, of the ACTH central to peripheral ratio is more than two uh, prior, to, prior to giving the CRH, this has 95% sensitivity of suggesting a pituitary source. And if it was more than three, uh, uh, if, if the ratio is more than three, so this will, 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 uh, will top up the sensitivity up to 100%. After stimulation, what you see usually, if it was a picture of pituitary, again, it does not diagnose it or confirm it. However, you would see an increase of more than three folds. In ectopic ACTH sources, it has no or reduced response. And if there was a slight rise, it will be less than three folds. Now let's could go to- go, Could you go back to the, that picture, that nice picture you've drawn in yes. that one, yeah? So just to point out to everybody, you see those two orange catheters, right? So they are draining the pituitary. Now, if you move that catheter in by another two millimeters, you'll get a much higher concentration. If it's slightly out, you get a lower concentration. Very tiny movements make a big difference. And the second thing is that if at the other end of the catheter, you'll assume you suck, if you suck blood, you'll get blood coming backwards and therefore you'll get less pituitary blood. So if you want to get the pituitary blood, they let it droop out. They don't suck very hard. So it takes a while to get the blood out. So if you, so it's very technically uh, difficult and you need a very, very good team of people to do this properly. Okay, so the position they see on the 
on the imaging, but a very small difference makes a big difference to the amount of prolactin, which I think you will see in a bit. Okay, thanks. So what happened to this patient after all this testing? She was started on metarbone actually before the IPSS and continued later. And this is the this is her result of IPSS. So let's go through this. So as I mentioned earlier, you start by looking at the prolactin. Sorry. So we start by looking at okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we start by looking at the prolactin, and you can see the gradient here between the central, which is you have in the uh, uh, left and then right, and then we have the peripheral. So you can see the gradient between the levels here. Like it's almost more than like even double of the uh, peripheral results. So that confirmed the that we are uh, uh, that's confirm successful catheterization. Then yeah, we go more back than, more than 1.8. Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. Yeah. More than 1.8. Okay. And then we go to look at the ACTH uh, gradient here. And if you can see the difference between even at baseline and after stimulation, so we, we go through them all. Uh, and you can see that there is minimal changes, even like a reduction in the, in the level. So um, from this, you can see that there is no ACTH gradient uh, between pituitary and peripheral. Uh, and there is no response even after CRH stimulation. And this would suggest um, an ectopic source of um, an ectopic source of ACTH exists. Okay, so and this I patient of that on the on the um, internet on the, quiz. On the web page yeah. of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Amir says need to look at basal prolactin. Yeah. The basal prolactin is is all yeah, is Eight, eight, seven, and three. As opposed to the stimulated one you highlighted, so it's best to look at the one at point zero. Yes, yes. yes. It's interesting, isn't it? Because when you stimulate, there is a rise, and we always see this. There's a rise in, in prolactin from the lactotropes. So this patient, she was referred to a cardiothoracic surgery, and she had right lobe uh, pulmonary nodule resected. So the histology was consistent with a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, and there was no pathological lymph nodes seen or none, had, so, so none uh, were removed. Post-operatively, she was uh, discharged on hydrocortisone dose 1055. She, uh, her follow-up has been arranged in two weeks, three months, and then uh, every six months with continuous testing for, uh, of possible recovery of the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Overall approach of ectopic caching, uh, so it, it is actually similar to the pituitary or other like, uh, or adrenal. We start by surgical resection, preoperatively or postoperatively, both uh, like preoperatively before pre uh, for preparation for the surgery, patient would receive medical treatment, including stereodigenesis inhibitors given, uh, given before the uh, surgery. And that could, could be uh, metyropone, ketoconazole, or newer, uh, newer treatments that are available. Uh, patient might require corticosteroid replacement during this period as a block and replacement, or af and, and also after the uh, after the treatment, as the patient uh, is used to high dose of steroid of, of corticosteroid within the body. Very important is to also not to forget about the antithrombotic prophylaxis. The patient will have a day three to four, 9 a.m. cortisol and ACTH assessment. A cortisol level of less than 50 would suggest remission. Actually, an undetectable level give higher chance for long-term remission and less, lesser chance of recurrence. Now, what is usually the aim for uh, uh, during our follow-up? It is very important to follow those patients closely initially and then to space it based on uh, patient, patient per patient uh, approach. Uh, very important uh, points to highlight here is to is the aim of the follow up is to detect recurrent of, recurrence of Cushing to optimize the medical management of the morbid of the morbidities that has that is related to the cortisol exists and what is actually all about this class is to reassess for pituitary adrenal reawakening 
And how do you do that usually? By regular assessment of cortisol production while the patient is off glucocorticoid. So you always challenge the patient. Recurrent disease must be excluded initially. And then if excluded, to assess the adequacy of a stress response once weaned off a glucocorticoid. And there are different uh, testing available, but depend on their availability and the, their validity on, uh, on the center. So you can use a short synactin test, TRH stimulation test, glucagon stress test, or uh, insulin tolerance test. So what happened to our patient? In two weeks post-op, she had short synactin test that she that reported to, to have continued uh, continue to have ACTH deficiency with suboptimal rise on glucagon stress test as well. So she had both uh, SST and glucagon stress test. Uh, she was kept on 10.55 of hydrocortisone. Then in a three-month follow-up after the surgery, she had again another glucagon stress test that uh, has reported being uh, that the patient is still under replaced with the hydroport with a predose level less than 20 and 32. Um, and her ACTH level remained uh, uh, suboptimal. Hmm. In February 2014, the, the patient, she had a hydrocortisone daycare that reported inadequate replacement and continued ACTH uh, deficiency. Her hydrocortisone dose has, been, has increased to 12.5, 7.5, and 5. So she had also further testing again. Her latest test was done in October 2016, and that uh, her recent, uh, that this is the most recent one, showed a peak cortisol of 300, and, um, and this result suggests that she is still cortisol deficient and therefore require hydrocortisone. What will you do next? Would you keep the patient on the same dose, switch her to prednisolone, increase the dose of hydrocort, or reduce the dose and reassess? Okay, so you can all vote. The votes are coming in, I can see, but I want 100 votes, okay? So have a look carefully at that glucagon stress test. Okay, five seconds. Okay, five seconds, four, three, two. Oh, this is more controversial. So there's quite a spread. Now I must say, uh, yeah, this is thought. So, so quite a spread there. So B, switch to penicillin seems to be the most popular. Um, I think we've done badly here, haven't we? We're, we're not trying to wean her really. And we know she she has an intact pituitary and you've got two intact adrenals. The problem was an ectopic source of ATTH, which is now out. And she's now on a hydrocortisone. We put those up because she didn't quite reach the level that we like. So we're, we're going to suppress her more. Um, that'll make her feel okay. But I think in the long run, we might shorten her life with whatever it is, osteoporosis, fractures, diabetes, hypertension, all the things that we know the steroids cause. So, so I, what we've done is C, but I think what we should do is D um, at the moment. But let's see, let's see what actually happened. I'll just stop sharing. Do you want to carry on, Shama? Oh, I think she's frozen. Okay, while we're waiting for her to come back online, because I'm sure she will in just a second. I'm gonna have a go answering the questions on the chat, because there's quite a few of them. Oh, we've lost them, haven't we? Um, yeah. Okay, let's have a look at the chat then. So, On PRED, if you plan to do an SST, you don't need to stop it between prayers. You just have your dose and then 
when you have your SST, you don't have it on the morning of the test. Just come in the morning with your prednisolone tablets. You have your blood test, you have synaptin injection, two more samples, and you can take your pred after that. So they don't actually miss it at all. So you just don't have it on the day of the test. So that's that's another advantage of, of pred. Although they say, how long do you stop having cause them for beforehand? So that's quite easy. Um, now, Anara has put down something about localizing the uh, adenoma. And one of the problems with localizing these things is that on that blood supply that um, Shama put up on this, there's in about 30% of the people, there is flow going across. And so it's not accurate. I mean, it might be, it might be. So I'm going to stick to its only role is to absolutely exclude ectopic ACTH. And then you need to find other ways of finding the actual tumor in the pituitary gland, uh, like MRI. Um, Amir has already told us about the beta prolactin. It can be capital of the mood, so thinking <laughs> very still. That's why you do prolactins at all the time points to, to, to kind of make sure that, that it hasn't moved. Um, but yes, of course it could. Of course it could. And then Ash has asked two questions. Firstly, um, well, he says two questions, then he won. Using a metyrapone day curve. So this is something that, that we have done in the past. So patients who um, have Cushing's and they're on regular metyrapone, we want to know how suppressed they are. And so we bring them in and do quarter levels through the day. And they go up and down because metyrapone is, is a, not a very potent drug. You need a very, very large dose. And we really struggle. And so I, I hear Asher's pain that when we do it, we get a book numbers that seem quite random. I will say the future is oscillogostat, which is much, much more potent, much, much more effective, and um, is associated with uh, Addisonian crisis quite quickly. So, um, so, so, so actually those day curves are useful because we're having to start giving people um, a combination of oscillogostat and uh, prednisolone, very small doses. Um, this is, we're just starting to do it in the UK. So it hasn't been licensed until recently. Um, we're still struggling with finances, but uh, hopefully we'll get a supply. We've got about two patients who are on it because the drug company have kindly given it to us, but that's just at the very start. Other countries have used it much more. Um, Europe and the US have had it for a little while. Uh, why plaque levels on one side was very high. Um, yeah, so it was very high on, on one side, and that's probably because it was one millimeter in further. So when you put them in, you just get an x-ray picture. And if one is a little bit closer, and remember, we don't get the results last, but so the, so the radiologist looks at the picture, looks at where the scan is, takes the blood, gives it to us, and then we get all the results later, and we realize that one was in further than the other. And sometimes we say, gosh, did, was that successful? Shall we do the eyepieces again? And they usually say, no, we've done as good a job as we can, so there's no point doing it, because they are very good, I will say, at getting very, very good numbers. Okay, My apologies, we... I don't know what happened. Oh, that's all right, you're back. Okay, do you want to yeah. carry on? I just yeah, sure. The chat. You want to carry on from where you left off? Yeah, so I, I was just about to uh, I... like give the final outcome of what happened to the patient, and uh, we were highlighting that she was kept on the same dose of 12.5, 7.5, and 5, based on her continuous uh, um, complaints of feeling tired and awful and lack of energy. Her latest blood test was, was done in January 2022 that showed put normal potassium ACTH level of 5.3 and 9 a.m. serum cortisol of 222. In terms of her comorbidities, her diabetes resolved. Her, she, uh, she continued to have high, high blood pressure, and she's on amlodipine. Uh, she did not lose much weight, and she, her weight remained stable. She was overweight. Her osteoporosis improved with an evidence of DEC index and her latest DEXA scan that showed a normal bone scan. So the, the last and final open question, actually, would you still consider running the patient law to assess her uh, HPA recovery or not? Thank you so much. Thank you. Any thoughts about that? Do you want to go back a slide and leave that orange question up? Yes. Yeah, I agree, Nicoletta. Um, I've, I've, well, I say not much hope. Of course, 
it's my fault because I've put the hydrocodone up on that day curve. She's on, I think, I, I think I've made a mistake. I think I need to think about what that orange line says now. But uh, yes, I'm less hopeful. I think it will need a long discussion with the patient because the patient's going to say, oh my goodness me, I have to go up and not feel a bit better. You want me to go down. And it's not a, it's not a fast path. It's a very slow, every time they use, use the dose, they feel achy. You know, it's, I mean, she's effectively dependent it's almost like an addiction, but it's physical, and therefore you just can't stop it. So if the patient's not on board, I'm not going to even try, but I, I would like to explain to her that she has a normal that has been suppressed by her uh, hydrocortisone, and she has two normal adrenals, so we can, we can hopefully help. It might, Anna, I don't know. So I will declare that we haven't got any evidence that penicillin is better it's just that when i've tried it, it seems to be but i would to, to give that kind of evidence is quite hard but i think i think we should do a proper bit of research to work it out rather than just assume it because what endocrines do a lot is say well my way works so use it and uh, i think we should not do that i think we should use what works and we should work out what works um with some with some data my, my suspicion is that might help. There might be some psychology on the IPSS proactin, James Findling. Yes, so James Findling is a great author. He's got he's the guy who wrote the paper also about saying the high dose dex suppression test should be abandoned. Um, so that's uh, and and if you want to discover a journal club in the future, I think we should. It's one that you need to have seen. Yes, I know, Alison. So I think the problem, right, the problem is our reference ranges for morning cortisols are probably wrong. <laughs> this is quite something, isn't it? Um, but yes, I think I think underrunning in the morning is really hard. And I think I think if we can reduce the evening dose for starters, but but I mean 12.5 is is a generous dose but i accept the, the other problem Alison, is that the timing of your blood test after the hypothalamus the big difference the level that you measured oh really good question david h um what is the rationale so um yeah there are two problems with both the tests i mean they're both not good okay the best test is an itt and that is also not a great test okay so the truth is there is no really good test and we walk off our biases uh the problem with the synaxin test is that if your adrenals are okay so this especially applies after, just after surgery because when she was cushioned with all that ectopic ac she had huge juicy adrenal if you had a synaxin test she would have zoomed up even though her baseline acth is now gone so the synaxin test will look good when actually she can't make any of her own ACTH. So that's why we don't want to do uh, synaxin tests in patients who've had cushions in the past, because you've changed something. Now, all these years later, you're quite right. We probably could do a synaxin test. Glucagon actually tests the pituitary gland, we believe, but I will say it's not a great test. So a lot of normal people fail the glucagon test. So that's a problem. And then ITTs can't be done in some people for various reasons for safety. Okay, DJL, I don't know the answer to the question. Should we use it immediately or a few months post-surgery? Uh, well, in the case I just showed you, it was a year post-surgery. Maybe that helped. Maybe she had a year of slow recovery. Um, I will say that in those patients who we have got off steroids over the years, and other centers have said the same thing, it takes at least a year. It's not a quick thing. Um, so it's a good question. The answer is we don't know. Um, I'm going to be much more aggressive trying. Um, and when we've got enough, we've got to really try, okay, you mustn't give in. Giving in too early in these patients, that's ectopic ACTH and adrenal tumours, where the pituitary adrenal axis should be intact, we should do it. Um, but to, I don't know the answer to your question, Bijal. Um, I think we should at least try that because what my what I found, and I'm the same, in all the patients I've been looking after, I haven't tried hard enough. Now, let me see, Katie's asked something here. Increasing hydrocortisone previously didn't help symptoms. Yes, currently she still has symptoms. Absolutely right. So kind of, yes, 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 yes. Katie, you're absolutely right. This is the problem. 
when people feel tired, we feel duty bound. I mean, can I tell you, there are a whole load of people who are not even Addisonian, who've got like adrenal fatigue and people have felt them on high cortisone. It's really terrible. So these people, you're, you're quite right, we've done the wrong thing. I've done the wrong thing and I need to uh, talk to the patient. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Lisa, you've got another uh, case. Shall we, do you want to share your screen, Lisa? You just share your screen until over a bit. Oh, no, it's not real. It's not real, Katie. I'm, I'll, I'll talk okay. about that in a minute, right? Okay, so do you want to share your screen, Lisa? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? Yeah, can do. Okay, so um, hi everyone and, and thanks Prof for um, uh, asking me to present this case. So my name is Lisa Mer, uh, registrar at Charing Cross. So um, this next case is a 40 year old woman who was referred to the endocrine clinic in Hillingdon Hospital around March 2020. And she has quite a long history of depression dating back to 20, 2002, um, which was uh, following a miscarriage at the time and that was so she was in weight gain. Then in 2005, um, she um, developed a high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes uh, together. In 2013, she had a successful pregnancy and gave birth to a daughter. But unfortunately, this was followed by an um, episode of severe postnatal depression. Um, and she noticed further weight gain associated with that. And she also noticed some frontal balding and facial hirsutism. Um, and during all this time, she um, didn't seek any um, specialist um, input. And in 2018, she had another miscarriage, unfortunately. And in 2020, um, she had headaches um, and was referred from a neuro um, for initiated for a neurology opinion um, and then to the endocrine clinic. And when she was seen in the endocrine clinic, she had a BMI of 30 um, kilograms per meter squared. So there was evidence of facial plethora, central adiposity and thin skin, but no violaceous striae. She has some initial investigations here with some um, initial biochemistry, HGA1C and cholesterol, and a, uh, a pituitary panel. So I've got my first question here now. Based on what we've heard about her history and examination, these results, what's the likely diagnosis? Okay, so a poll should appear, and you've got A, B, C, or D. So do you want to vote now? So you can see the numbers on the left-hand side. Okay, so can I let you vote? So most people haven't voted yet. So Katie's asking you, uh, when were the bloods done? I think they were just, oh, you mean, you mean time of day, I think. I, I, True. Um, uh, so I believe that cortisol is a, is a um, random cortisol, not a 9 a.m. cortisol. So, so the answer, uh, we, don't, we don't know. So it might be an no, afternoon, it might be a morning. No, these are initial blood tests um, from an external hospital. Right, any more votes? I'll give you five more seconds. Okay, there's quite a spread there. So 27% have gone for pseudo cushions. Okay. And 39% uh, have gone for B. I mean, it could be A or B. I think if, if, if we don't know, A is really common uh, and B is less common. It definitely can't be, can't be adrenal because the ACTH is not suppressed. And it could be normal. Yes, I accept that. This could be a normal person who is, yeah, certainly possible. But they're all possible. Okay, right, I'm going to stop sharing. We're going to carry on. Uh, thank you. So that's very interesting. Um, so Gab, um, given I haven't given you a huge amount of endocrine information for an order of endocrinologist, but this is a young woman who's had a long history of depression with weight gain. Um, but then we did some further endocrine investigations to help us um, narrow down the diagnosis. So there we go. There we go. So she did she went and had an overnight dexma suppression test, and that showed a non-suppressed um, cortisol level of 389 and an ACH level of 79.9. She had a um, formal low-dose dexma suppression test as well, um, which again showed a non-suppressed cortisol at the end of 48 hours of 248. Um, she had a cortisol day curve here, which um, shows a loss of circadian rhythm with quite a flat um, cortisol profile throughout the day. And we also um, looked at free cortisol levels using late night. Life records 
capsule and a 24-hour urinary-free cortisol collection. So in total, she had three late-night salivary cortisols, and it's very important to do more than one, at least two of these. So then the first one was normal. Um, with um, low late light salivary cortisol and cortisone, but subsequently two further late light saliva cortisols were markedly raised um, with high saliva cortisol and saliva cortisones. And the 24-hour urinary free cortisol collection was also above the upper reference range. So now what is the likely diagnosis? Okay, so who wants the poll? And um, we've now got much more data, so we'd all like to vote for a, B, C, or D. And I'll give you all, please, 10 seconds to choose one of those four options. Five seconds. Well, Addison's asking a good question. Is there obstructive sleep apnea? So that's an important, uh, mm -hmm. important question. Um, I'm going to assume no. No. Okay, so most people have gone. Can you all see that? Yeah, Lisa, can you all see the, the have I shared it? Yes. I actually can't see the poll because I'm still sharing them. Oh, I see. Okay, well, most people have gone for B, okay? Like 81% have gone for B, um, which looks like the most likely answer given it's the most common. And she's really now saying to the press, but Alison's asking a very sensible question in that it might be something else causing an apparent cushing. That it still could be pseudo cushing, but mm. at least chemistry is now uh, consistent. So I'm much more likely to think this is B rather than A. Okay. okay. So thinking about it, looking like biochemical like cushings um, and ACTH dependent, what would you like to do next? So this one we got to vote for A, B or C. Great, 10 seconds. Five. Okay, great. I've got a few more votes than previously. Okay. Okay, and Heidi has also chosen A, as have 59% of people gone for MRI pituitary, and 37% have gone for pituitary sinus sample. Um, because we now have. I uh, agree, both of those are very reasonable. And in fact, we do go on. Yes. So yes, so just to, to get a bit of an interaction, but yes, we did do both. We did do A and B. So she went and had an MRI pituitary, and this, if you most one can see, shows quite a large lesion. This is a 12 by 10 millimeter right-sided solid cystic mass within the cella, um, in keeping with pituitary macroadenoma. Um, it um, spared the optic highs, and that actually didn't invade into the um, cavernous sinuses. This um, T1 so, I must say, quite big for cushioning because normally cushions mm. are really, really tiny barely visible. So this is quite a surprise. So she had quite a nice clear target on the MRI. Um, but that question is, is this the source of her HGH and high cortisol? She did then go undergo an IPSS. Um, and as we talked about before, we look at the basal um, prolactin levels and they are more, clearly more than 1.8, um, the upper uh, um, uh, versus the peripheral vein. Um, and then when you look at the ACH, it's clearly a. Um, yeah, the the, the for a minute. So you can see the platen there's mm -hmm. 10 times in the right. So the right looks like it's well cannulated. The left is probably cannulated, but it's not, is it 1.8? Mm, mm. Not quite. Not right. Yeah. So we're, but we're sure the right is in and the left is probably in, but it doesn't meet the criteria saying it's properly in. Is it, oh, wait a minute. The five minute one maybe does, but as. I mean, it's the baseline ones that matter. Mm -hmm. It's like 1.3, doesn't it? So the left isn't quite, but the right is. Okay. And I guess this also goes towards that lateralizing lesion because um, then if we are not certain about one of the sciences, then what we can say is that overall, there is a, a gradient from one of the patrol sciences to the peripheral vein. We, we can't say it's obviously on the right, the left is not um, adequately cannulated. But there is a, on the right, certainly a, um, uh, central peripheral ratio of more than two, the ACTH, and after CRH simulation, the ratio is uh, way more than um, three. So this um, certainly excludes an ectopic source ACTH, that's what we can say from these, this result. 
So it's right in there. And of course, that probably means that he's got the cancer right up against the source, that tumour. And if he's not aspirating, you get a nice, very high level like that. So, so we are pretty sure this is not ectopic ACTH. We have a nice lesion. Um, we did comment over at the side, and I think it's not safe to say it's on the right or the left, but the MRI is probably a more useful mark of where the tumour is. Okay, so, so now we're with um, clinical biochemical features of Cushing syndrome, a right side church lesion, and an exclusion ectopic ACTH on IPSS. How would you like to manage this patient? Okay, just give me, sorry, I was a bit slow there. I'll just launch it. Let's relaunch it. Um, there you go. Well, there's a very good question in the chat here. So the question is, does everyone get one? And of course, it depends on where you are in the world. So there's a lot of places in the world that haven't got IPSS. Um, so there are there's a there's a couple of papers suggesting that you can do other tests like um a combination of tests and imaging which makes one much more likely so for example in this patient one of the criteria that's been set is if the pituitary adenoma is more than six millimeters and this one is then you don't need an iPSS because it's quite likely to be there but you might be wrong and that's that's the time when you know if you operate on the pituitary gland and they're not cured you then wish you'd done one Okay, that's that's the issue. Okay, anyone anyone else voting? Five seconds. Yeah. Okay. So I oh, would definitely go for. It was a lovely tumor. Nice. Um, obviously, ask the surgeons if they're happy to produce surgeons to do that. Taking out both adrenals, I think one person wants to do. That'll work. Whatever the diagnosis. But of course, that renders the patient dependent on both hydrocortisone or prednisolone and fludrocortisone. And there's a much higher risk of adrenal crisis if you've got no adrenals than if you've got no pituitary, because at least you have aldosterone. Uh, we could start metyrapone, or in the future, it'll be osteostat for a bit. Uh, but surgery works. So we're going to carry on and just stop sharing. Um, certainly, as well, that surgery was fair last line. Um, how it, this was during the COVID pandemic, so she did start on some metyrapone um, for her symptoms, um, 250 milligrams twice a day um, as a holding measure, waiting for a surgical date. And she also starts on rivaroxaban, which is, um, as per the um, our policy in peril, to start rivaroxaban at the time of diagnosis of Cushing's and to continue on to six weeks after um, operating um, as well, due to that risk of um, increased risk of uh, venous thromboembolism. So she started with type of rock span, and then in September 2020, she underwent a transnodal section of her right side pituitary macroadenoma. And this is her post op MRI compared to the prep MRI. And it shows, um, after discussion um, with our surgeon MDT, showed a complete resection of that um, adenoma and with a normal residual pituitary left. So um, that was a good radiological result. And also on, on day two, post optively, she had a post op cortisol of less than 28. So what would you like to do now? Just relaunch. There we go. You've got three options A, B, or C. So give a hydrocortisone 10, 5, 5, give a prednisolone 6, or give a prednisolone 4. And let me give you 10 seconds. Come on, everyone, quickly vote. Five seconds. Okay, so C C is the most popular, um, and, and it's all the same. Yeah, there's all, everyone seems to have chosen all of them. So there's an equal number, Lisa, basically for A, B, or C. Okay, so um, certainly hydrocortisone is, is a very standard um, replacement dose of, um, of steroids. What uh, I just think to say is that this is quite a good result on day two post-op with that um, MRI as well. It shows that she's had the surgical cure um, of her um, ACH and Cushing's. What she needs now is, is steroid replacement. So you could give hydrocortisone. Um, at Imperial, we would give prednisolone and a standard dose would be four milligrams on steroid replacement. But she's got a Cushing, so um, often they require a higher dose of um, prednisolone and metabolize quickly and they're used to higher levels. So she went um, actually ended up having six milligrams um, of prednisolone um, after operation and um, shouldn't feel very well on four milligrams of prednisolone. 
Um, and we're seeing this more. It's saying, actually, I remember now, actually, we sent her, mm. we tried four, and she felt mm. terrible. Yeah. And she went up to the department, and so someone helped me put it up to six, and she felt better. So that's what actually happened. And then there's a question, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Shall we have a go at those quickly before we uh, mm -hmm. look at the chat quickly? So that's what happened. Um, CRH test before IPSS? Before IPSS, no. Well, well you know, some centres do it. It's another test to confirm Cushing that some centres use. Um, yes, the IPSS will, will be affected if they're on it. They've got, it's got to be stopped before you're the IPSS and we say for seven days. Uh, that's a bit empirical because the problem is if you put someone on their um, you will increase the pituitary. So let's say I have ectopic ACTH, right? Um, if you give, uh, that will suppress my pituitary and therefore I get flat level. If you give them a tyrophone first, it will suppress my adrenals, my pituitary will then wake up and it'll look like a pituitary source, but that's the danger of using my tyrophone because I need to do it at ACTH and that might not happen. But you want to carry on. Okay. So she went home on prednisone, six milligrams. And um, she was in clinic um, a couple of weeks later and she's feeling well, she's losing weight and there's improvement in her facial plaque as well. So two months post-op, she has repeat um, cortisol day curve and these are the values. So she's um, still on prednisone, six milligrams at this point. What would you like to do? Ooh, I'll just launch the poll again. A, B or C. Okay, 10 seconds. Yeah, so most people have gone for C, which I'm quite happy about. This is a bit more di different, isn't it? Because this patient has had pituitary surgery, so you might not have and intact axis. Okay, so C is what we've chosen, uh, Lisa. Well, and that's probably a product of having listened to the uh, earlier talks today, because um, probably, uh, certainly so she feels whilst needing to increase her friendliness, but a lot of people might not reduce the dose given um, the flat day curve. But I think what you mentioned, actually, probably when you saw in clinic, was that she had an undetectable cortisol maybe post-op, and here there is some cortisol being made and she feels quite good um so potentially we could try and and wean off and we don't try and reduce that prednisone we won't know and um she actually was really really keen to come off prednisone um there was consistent um, documentation that the patient would like to come off so um she waited a little bit longer um and um she started trialing to take her prednisone down for six milligrams of five and actually using that imperial protocol she weaned down herself based on symptoms alone from six milligrams to zero over the course of six months and by may 2021 um she, eight months post op she completely stopped prednisolone and um, in february 2022 nine months of steroids should repeat shorts and i showed a short snapping test and this was results which is completely normal um so in discussion um as we've been mentioned before that um, it is safe to wean steroids post pituitary surgery if you carefully select the patients and you closely monitor for adrenal um the adrenal function initially um and then i guess we previously were always quite worried about um weaning steroids and pituitary patients not knowing how much pituitary function is left but um if we don't try and under replace um, steroids in these patients, we won't allow the pituitary adrenals to recover. So if we don't try, we won't know. Um, and if we do try and wean, then a slow and gradual reduction will probably give the best chance of success um, to minimize those symptoms and allow the patients to sort of um, maintain their confidence in the wean and to carry on weaning. And that's it, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Now, I'm gonna just share my screen. And continue where we left off and look for questions. So just before we have any questions, this is the situation with a pituitary dependent pushing, there's my pituitary adenoma making ACTH, right, like the one you saw. And of course I have nice bulky adrenal, so a synaxin test will look really good. And in this Cushingoid patient, you have a high cortisol, which will suppress the normal cortical around the edge, and the tumor is making lots of uh, ACTH, okay? Now, what we used to do was a total hypophysectomy, okay? That was the original treatment 
just take out the whole pituitary gland in the 70s, 80s, and up to about 1990, until we developed or had specialist neurosurgeons. Because until then, it was done by a general neurosurgeon. Pituitary hypothesis was one of the operations. But a publication from Manchester demonstrated that if you have a dedicated pituitary surgeon, that was 1990, that you have better outcomes. But until then, this was the procedure. If you take out the whole pituitary gland, you will, of course, have no ACTH. And if you have no cortisol, less than 50. But if the whole thing's gone, they're going to need replacement steroids forever because the whole pituitary has been removed. And they will probably need two other steroids, uh, sorry, things, thyroxine and sex steroids. And if you try to wean these patients, you're going to fail because there's no corticotropes left. Okay, so this is a problem. We have a lot of old patients who have that operation and they're quite happy and well, but I think they're not in the best hands. There's nothing we can do about it. So they are in the best hands under us. But after 1990, our surgeons definitely got better. I've got data on our surgeons getting better and better year on year since 1990. And what we're doing now is they're just removing, they can see it and they take out the tumour and they leave behind the pituitary gland. So the ACH disappears in the same way you have as a very low cortisol, less than 50. But this time there are some, I hope, I hope around the ACH and corticotropes. They still at the start need some replacement because they're all totally suppressed. And I'm going to say 10, 5, 2.5 or FRED3. But if you give too much, you will persistently suppress them, just like the adrenal patients. It's more difficult, though, because they have had some damage. So you're a bit nervous. Uh, but in the patient that Elise just told us about, OK, this must have happened because we wean the patient down. Now, it did help that the patient, she was achy and stuff, but she totally bought my explanation that coming off it is the way forward. And it was hard. She struggled with it. I had lots of email traffic in those nine months about saying, keep going, it's looking better. She would occasionally have a random, we didn't do any dynamic tests, we just did occasional cortisols because she lived in Brand Hillingdon and you would come up here for random. And each time was a little bit better. Um, so basically what you need to do is safely and slowly reduce the dose with some monitoring just of baseline cortisol, I think is all you need, and ACTHs to show some recovery. And eventually there will be recovery and then the adrenal will recover and hopefully, when the cortisol is about 200 nanomoles per litre, we then know, and of course, you saw the synaptic test, the baseline cortisol was just about 200. So if you have a perfect neurosurgeon who takes out the, the cortical of tumour, the patient will start off needing steroid replacement if it was Cushing's, okay? Because the normal cells, corticotropes, are suppressed and atrophied because they may have been undiagnosed for many years. And if you really work with them, you can recover. Um, but prednisone is he's not as good as, as your natural hormone, as I told you earlier, and as I keep telling you, this late peak is a, is a problem. Okay, you get eventual recovery, and um, what you basically need is a morning cortisol before they get their pred dose to monitor them over time, and keep pushing it down as long as they feel well, and know that they'll be safe um, on three milligrams. Then below three is when it starts to get interesting. OK, so the best outcome is if you can remove the tumour alone. And once they're weaned, then they'll have perfect results. Right, Erica's on and she's going to do a third case. Yes. Do you want to share your screen, Erica? Yes. Hello. Uh, one second. Can you see it? Not yet. So oh. if you click the green button oh, and, yeah, yeah. and then choose the left hand top one, usually that usually works. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Erika. I'm one of the endocrine registrar in St. Mary's Hospital. We have another interesting case to present. So this is the case of a 54 years old um, lady with a recent diagnosis of hypercholesterolemia, type two diabetes, and hypertension. Erika, do you want to do you want to press on the um, the single screen because we can see oh, all. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. Can you see better now? Yes. Perfect, yes. So 54 years old uh, lady with a recent diagnosis of hypercholesterolemia, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. She was referred to the endocrine clinic with worsening facial swelling and proximal myopathy. At that time, she was not taking any steroids, but was, she was clinically Cushingoid. So she had an endocrine workup, as you can see here. Um, she had two samples for 
24 hour um, urine collection for free cortisol, which showed an elevated cortisol. She had an overnight dexamethasone suppression test, which showed a non suppressed cortisol of 752. And then she had a low dose dexamethasone suppression test, which again showed a non suppressed cortisol at 48 hours and an elevated ACTH. Now, at this point, we have a question. So, what is the most likely diagnosis? Is this a pituitary dependent Cushing disease? Is this an ectopic ACTH or is this an adrenal Cushing's? It's a little bit a tricky question. Yeah, just go back one slide so that everyone can yes, see. Yes, yeah, so they can have a look. Oh, mm -hmm. I cannot. Uh, yes. yes you can. So yeah. those are the tests, and we want to know if it's um, a pituitary dependent Cushing disease, if this is an ectopic Cushing, or is an adrenal Cushing. <clears throat> Okay, 10 seconds, everybody. So, so the options were, just to, just to read them out again, because we can't do the order now, we should put it on the same slide, but never mind. So A was... So A is um, a pit, um, pituitary Cushing, uh, B, ectopic Cushing, and C, um, adrenal Cushing. Okay. <laughs> Five seconds. Okay, so most people have gone for A. Just go forward one slide to the options. Yes, most people have gone for A pituitary, quite a lot. So 60% gone for A, 30% for B, and one or two for C. It, I think the problem with adrenal is the ACTH was detect was quite high, in fact. Yes. So C, yes. but it could be A or B, okay? Right. Yes. Okay. So, but obviously, uh, we cannot establish a, mm -hmm. a, a ectopic ACTH or pituitary pushing only by those tests. Mm -hmm. So she had uh, a pituitary MRI, uh, and we can see on the pituitary MRI on enlargement at the left side of the pituitary gland, but no uh, clear adenomal mass. So the, uh, the next question we have is, this lady has a, a clinical picture, um, the clinical features of Cushing. She has an ACTH-dependent Cushing syndrome, she has a pituitary MRI showing uh, enlargement on the left side of the pituitary gland. So what treatment should we start this patient on? And to answer the question, you can use the chart. Okay, we might get, this might be a bit risky. Let's see what people do. Yeah. <laughs> before I move on, before you do that, someone's put isolated A as it's common. Yes, you're quite right. A is common. Right, here come the options. So Faria is going for a TSS, that's transfrontal surgery. surgery. Uh, how about drugs? Any drugs? That you, okay, so Matt wants to start off. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. If we have it, that's right. IPSS. To assess salt and metaraponin yeah. waiting. Or yeah. ketoconazole. Yes, very good. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. So metaraponin or ketoconazole or oseldostat. I'm um, just yeah. wondering if anyone puts any other drug. There's one other drug that we mentioned earlier today that we should all think about. Do you want to go to the next slide because the answer's on there? Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. So she was, uh, I don't know why I cannot see. Is it just, yeah. No, no, if you just click, it, it'll work. Yeah. Okay. So she was started on ketoconazole 100 milligram twice a day. And then she underwent an IPSS in September. Uh, yeah, the other, the other drug, by the way, is rivaroxaban. So and so we should all be doing this, by the way. If you think, if you have definitely got someone who's got Cushing syndrome, there is definitely, you do a great job on the pituitary and they have a massive pulmonary embolus. Okay, we've had one, not massive, but PE. Um, so, and, and it's published now, there's a lot of data saying that there is an increased risk. What to do about it hasn't yet been agreed, but we now use a baroxaban. Um, so that's what I think we all think about. Okay, carry on, Erica. Great. Um, so she had an IPSS, and now we want to focus on the IPSS results of this lady. So you can see here the results. Um, look at the results, please. And then we have a question, and I will display again the results so you have uh, more time to select the proper um, answer. So uh, how do you interpret those results? Is this not interpretable? Is this an ectopic source? 
or is this p Twitter resource? You can see here again the results. So is this not uh, interpretable? Is this ectopic? Is this p Twitter? -y? So you have three options. Okay, so B is ectopic and C is pituitary and A is uninterpretable. uninterpretable. Let's speed that up there for a bit. And while you're all thinking about that, there's something in the chat. Um, how many days before TSS should it be stopped? So the surgeons are happy for it to be stopped two days or three days in advance. And the same applies for IPSS, of course, because you puncture vessels um, in the groin. And so they need to off rivaroxaban for the IPSS as well as surgery. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, there's a few words coming in. So five more seconds. You were thinking really hard there, Eric, about your yeah. It's a tricky. It's a tricky. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. So there's forty-three percent gone for A, thirty-five for B. So A is uninterpretable. So most people think it's not interpretable. That, that's 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 yeah. um, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So okay, let's go to get together through the results. So first of all, we look at the prolactin because we want to be sure that the um, catheters are placed correctly. So, and if you look at baseline, there was an initial concern about the left retrosal sinus cannulation because the prolactin is actually lower than the right retrosal sinus. However, it raised up to 500 at five minutes. So we are sure that the catheters, catheters are placed correctly. Then a second step, we look at the ACTH, as we can see at baseline, minus five minutes and zero, the level, the ACTH level were most equivalent in all the three samples. And the same happens at minute 10. This is very similar to the results we have seen in the first case presented by Shama, which uh, was a case um, consistent with an ectopic ACTH. So what is unusual in these results is actually at minute two and minute five, because at minute two and minute five, we have a central peripheral gradient, a minimal gradient. So at minute two is 2.0, and at minute five is uh, 1.7. So the results are definitely consistent with an ectopic ACTH, but why do we have this minimal gradient at minute two and minute five? So we can explain this better by looking at this picture. So you can see in this picture, the left femoral vein and the right femoral vein where the catheters are placed. Then we number one, the CRH. The CRH is given into a peripheral vein. The CRH then travel via the SVC and the heart to the lung. In the lung, the CRH stimulates the ACTH. And then uh, to the aorta, the CTH travels to the pituitary and then to the legs. But the time for the CTH to reach the pituitary is quicker than the time to reach the legs. So if we go back at our results, um, this is actually what happens at minute two and five. At minute two and five, we have a minimal gradient because the ectopic CTH has reached the pituitary gland, but not entirely the peripheral vein while at minute 10 has reached in the entire body. So we don't have a gradient anymore. So this is the explanation of these unusual results. Prof Miran, do you want to add something here? No, I think, I think that's very well uh, said. I think it's very unusual this, okay? This is not a very typical case. The ones that you, for exam purposes that you need to know are the straightforward pituitary and ectopic, okay? Which are on, I'll put a copy of them. This third one is very unusual. Uh, but I think Erica's explanation is the most likely. Could you explain the rationale behind? Yes, yes. So, so in this patient, Ali, this patient, it did respond. The CRH ectopically did respond. You're going to see the outcome of, of surgery in a minute. So we know, we know we're right. But let's just go back to the first question. Could you explain the rationale behind concluding the catheter is in the right place once again? Okay. So the concern there is, leave this on. So if you look at the pituitary, so the first the first one, the peripheral is 227 and the right is correct. The left looks like it's not in, right? And when you inject um, 
CRH, in the peripheral vein, there's no rise. And in the left betrothal, there is a rise. Now, by the definition that we have, we're not really certain it's in the, in the right place, but it's pretty close, okay? Because it, the baselines are not good enough, but the, there is a rise. So it's, it's in that territory, but you're right, it's not fully in. Um, and so, in fact, what we did was I went back to the radiologist and said, are you sure this is in? Can we do it again? And he looked at the picture. You see, this is the thing. He looked at his angiogram and said, no, I'm absolutely sure I was as close as I could get. And so there's no point doing it again, um, unless you think it's cyclical. So he was, I was saying, can we do it again? Because I couldn't interpret it at first. And then we worked out this possibility that Eric has explained where the, the cannula, the peripheral cannula is in the IVC, right? And so the blood's got from the tumor has got to go down the aorta, down the legs, up the vein, and then it gets into the central vein. We asked the radiologist and he said, yes, it takes about another few minutes to get to the IVC compared to the pituitary gland. So that would explain it. Okay, so I, Ali, yes, it does. So some of these, some of these ectopic tumors are well differentiated. So if it's a carcinoid tumor, it's well differentiated. It will have the receptors for CRH. Um, the same as the pituitary gland. It's how well differentiated it is compared to um, a less aggressive tumor. Okay, and then, then Dorothy's quite right. We don't need to measure cortisol. It's just another control to make sure that we've got the sample from the right patient. To be totally honest, because they need to be Cushingoid at the time of the sampling. Okay, carry on, uh, Eric, right. very clear. All right. So, okay, so we have a question now. Uh, so what would you do next? Repeat the PSS, uh, B, transphenodyl hypothetectomy, C, gallium 68 can, or D, methionine, uh, methionine um, PET CT. So A, repeat A, IPSS, B, transphenodyl hypothesectomy, C, gallium 68 scan, and C, methionine PET CT. And the reason I put this question in is that this question came up, in fact, in the uh, endocrine symposium, and um, there's some feedback from people wanting to discuss this, so that's what we're going to do now. Okay, five seconds. And so the most popular answer is, yes, yeah, 62% have gone for C, which is a gallium dotate scan. Um, and D, now D is actually a scan of the pituitary gland, as we'll show you later. So that's why we think it's ectopic, don't we? From what we've just said. And that's why we want to go for C. Excellent. So, and actually she underwent a uh, gallium 68 scan, which showed that a metal, a, eight millimeter tracer avid nodule in the left lingual of the lung, which was not amendable for biopsy, but for resection. And we have the timeline again here. So she had the scan, was discussed with the MDT, and in October, she had a surgery, a lingulectomy, and the histology confirmed a typical carcinoid. So how did, how did we manage this lady uh, peri and postoperatively? So the day of the surgery, she had a steroid cover with hydrocortisone 50 milligram IM QDS. The first dose was given before the surgery. The day after the surgery, 10 milligram of penicillin and thereafter five milligram. We measured the cortisol level at the three days post surgery, which came back as 40, 45. So it was um, a very, very uh, reassuring result. And she was discharged on five milligram penicillin. Um, Four weeks after surgery, as per our protocol, she underwent a prednisolone day curve, as you can see here, and the prednisolone level at eight hour came back at 29. So we know that the range, the normal range is between 15 and 25. So, um, and the patient at that time felt very tired. But why did she feel tired? We, we already explained this during the, the, our talk today. Because, because of the Cushing, she was used to a higher level of cortisol, which obviously went uh, down after uh, the surgery. Uh, so that, this is why um, the patient felt tired despite, uh, despite having a good steroid coverage. And she was started on our um, prednisolone weaning program. Uh, we talked about this already at the beginning. So it's a slow weaning 
uh, those regimen. Uh, on the 20th of November, she was, which is week two, she was on uh, prednisolone four, which was slowly reduced, as you can see here. And the last level of cortisol that we have is actually from the 3rd of January, and it was uh, 223, so it's very, a, a very good level. We can see here overall uh, the trend uh, during the timeline of her cortisol, so it was 752 uh, at the time of diagnosis. When we started the ketoconazole was around 1,000, which nicely went down uh, um, uh, on ketoconazole treatment. She had the surgery here, and the cortisol level post three days was 45. Uh, she was on winning those of um, prednisolone regimen here, and the last level is actually very good, is 223. So uh, the, this patient has been, I mean, she has been cured for Cushing, we can say that. Also clinically, she's much better. She has a reduction in Cushing on features. She has a much better glycemic control, blood pressure control, and she's obviously on um, a very close uh, follow-up and monitoring. Thank you very much. Prof, you want to add something? Uh, I just, can you go back to slides? Yeah, go back one more to that protocol. So I'll sure. just point out, this. I made this for this patient because uh, when we went down to four, she had lots of aches and pains. And so you'll notice that I've actually moved it up. So whereas going, the other protocol had four, three, four, three alternative days, for her, I'm doing it much more slowly. And she's now on week seven. She email, emails me twice a week because she's okay. She's back at work and she's on week seven, but she wants to repeat week seven uh, for a couple of weeks. So so this is, this is and I'm going to really help her because if I don't, she'll end up staying on those forever. But I think if we work at it, I think in a year we might get her off it, but it's not going to be easy because she's really, really um, having aches and pains and her joints are aching and she has, you know, but it's not arthritis. It's it's the features of steroid withdrawal in someone who's been exposed to steroids for a long, long time and suddenly we've taken them away. Good. Thank you. That thank was you very uh, much. clear. I'm thank going to share you. my screen and just quickly talk about some scans and look to see if there's any other questions from anybody. Is it really for the 9 a.m. cortisol? Well, David, I will say yes. I think, I think I've got more confident at not doing dynamic tests um, because I assay for cortisol is, is good. The problem is it, it varies. Sometimes I find synaptin tests reassure me, but that's all it does. It doesn't help the patient really because we have to get there in the end. And the thing that stops you is not the cortisol. You feel happier. I say to the patient, good news is a good cortisol. Uh, but she's gonna, she's gonna, no, no, the problem with Nicoletta, uh, when she takes three, she's on four, four, three, four, four, three, right? And the day after she takes three, she feels really achy and unhappy and, and a bit bad. But this is exactly the same as I have with the PG patient. When we did from four to three to two, there were lots of emails going up and down, but she finally got there. Yes, I thought that. So, Ash, I've referred several patients to rheumatologists, and they've all come back to me saying, no, this is just normal. There's no evidence of any autoimmune disease. This is simply aches and pains caused by the, caused by the um, lack of cortisol that they're used to. And the other question that Anna wrote was about, why start on six? And the answer is, experience in some patients, I've tried four, and they just, I mean, we try four at the start. And they would really give us a hard time saying, I can't bear this. I'm, this operation was a disaster. I'm feeling awful. And then when they're on six, they seem to feel okay. Yes, the answer is opiates definitely blunt cortisol and SSTs. So the baseline drops, right? And if your baseline is low, even if you rise by 170, you're not going to hit a good peak. So, so, um, so yes, the answer to that question. Um, let's just quickly look if there's any other. Oh, yes. And then River Rocks. So the data um, is that. DVTs occur for six months after you've cured someone, so at least six months post uh, surgery, and then and then the risk seems to go down. So immediately post operatively, it seems to be quite high. In the second case, rep recovery. Um, does the patient have a high risk of recurrence? Um, I don't. Oh, I see. Because the axis got too good. Yes, 
Yes, so that's a good point. Okay, so the point Abdullah is making is this might be a topic, not that the patient is recovering, but the patient's cushing is recurring. So we've got to watch out for that. Okay, that is that is uh, certainly a possibility. Okay, I'm going to just spend a few minutes just going through. So you answered this question, um, and I'll just point out, we did the start, okay? So I'll just point out where these different scans are, and we'll finish in five minutes. So these are different scans that you will be expected to have heard of. In fact, not A and B, but um, C, D, E, and F you commonly use. And also, I'll show you a bone scan. So this is an FGG, fluorodeoxyglucose scan. And that is basically where you give someone fluorine labeled glucose. So any cell that undertakes glycolysis will take this up. And that means the brain, the brain is a lot of glucose. So if you see a hot brain, it's going to be an FDG bit. So if someone asks you, what kind of scan is this? If the brain is hot, and these are obviously not METs, because METs also use glucose, then it's very useful for oncologists. This is not a new scan, it's a very old scan. It's been around for years. It's been very commonly used by oncology and it's the FDG PET, okay? Now, here are some other ones. So this is not widely used, only used in one place in the UK, and this is Cambridge. And it's a research scan. Um, it's not better yet than the MRI, but it is possible, and they're publishing data now, that methionine PET, so methionine is used for brain tumors, and they're starting to look at whether it's more hot in active corticotropes or acromegaly or prolactinomas uh, if you're thinking about operating in someone who has a difficult to find lesion or two lesions. And I will say, we, I'm not really sure, but it's, it's looking quite promising, but we definitely need the help of the Cambridge people to interpret it. And it can, at the moment, only be done there. So that's methionine impact of the pituitary gland. And the other scan that you'll hear about more and more is metomidate. So, so for adrenal scans, Currently, at Imperial, we don't do this. We do uh, adrenal vein sampling to bear both sides. But there is a move, and this is coming from Bart's mainly, to use metomidate scans. The scan is done in Cambridge again, because they've got this um, way of labelling it. And so this is a said to be cons and suppression on the other side. A bit controversial, I'll say, but it might be the future for Cohn syndrome. Okay, the other thing listing I've listed there is technetium 9 protectinate, which I hope you recognize as a, a normal thyroid scan. So again, the technetium is the label. Protectinate goes for the thyroid gland, and so you see a hot gray thyroid or a normal thyroid, but of course, use this to exclude um, viral thyroiditis with no uptake. You see, there's the head, there's the salivary glands, and um, this is a nice hot thyroid gland. Okay, the other label is technetium again, but this time sestamibi. So this is technetium in the middle and then and then six, sestamine six. So six maybe mo uh, molecules around the edge. And uh, you can then see the parathyroid gland very nicely um, after washout. So initially it goes into the heart because the heart seems to be very, it's all used for heart scans. The chiros use it a lot, but we use it for parathyroid gland. And when the background fades away, you can see a single Pathoid adenoma, and as you know, we do an ultrasound with this, and if they're concordant, we're pretty confident that that is the source of the uh, PTH. I've showed this already. FDG is the brain. Now, this is the scan that you will see more of. It's widely available now. Um, we've been using it for a few years, and this is the gallium dotatate. So, dotatate is the SSTR, somatostatin receptor, which goes for a load of endocrine cells. So there's the pituitary. The brain is not hot on gallium dotate scanning, but the pituitary is, you can see pituitary quite nicely. You can see most endocrine cells. So you can see a thyroid gland, it's got endocrine cells in it. Um, this patient has got some metastases, but you can see the spleen is boiling hot. So that is your marker. So if someone says, what scan is this? and you see a hot spleen, the kidneys always show up in most scans because of course it's urine, which has a high content of the radiation coming out of the patient and the bladder, okay? But the spleen being hot is a key feature of a gallium dotate scan. So if you're shown this scan and say, what kind of scan is it? Look at the spleen, if it's hot, it's a dotate gallium scan. If it's brain, think that one is FDG. Okay, and then just to finish off, we've got the MDP bone scan. This is again, technetium labeled bisphosphonate, used to call diphosphonate. 
and of course, it's useful for bone unitizing. This is looking at bone formation. Okay, so where there is bone, after a fracture, you'll see bone formation. This is a normal looking scan to me. It's symmetrical and um, any damage to bones, maybe, but if it's symmetrical, then I think it's normal. But you see one hot bone, then you might patch it. So it's useful after fractures. It's useful for bony metastases, where you've got bone formation growing into it. And it's useful in patch disease of the bone. It's 12 o'clock, and I think we're done. Thank you all very much for joining. Um, I'll re-advertise the next one, which is on the 1st of March. I'll put the date up um, on the relevant page on here. And uh, say thank you very much. I'll send you all the feedback thing in a bit. Have a rest, good rest of the day all. Thank you.